Thank you very much for coming. I'm Stuart Clown. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Innovation and Accountability at the Government Operations Agency. Uh, what we have today for you is a series of conversations uh, that we hope will uh, both educate you and intrigue you uh, for this new chapter that we're going into where we're going to be adding some new tools to our toolbox and setting up uh, some infrastructure to learn about them, learn when to use them. This all, this all won't happen today, but, uh, um, but we hope this is what we'll be looking at in the next year, how to use them and, uh, and, and how to really rethink uh, our approach to developing and building tools for the people that we serve. Um, it's my great pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce uh, Secretary Mary Bell Thatcher, who um, has been a lead instigator and uh, catalyst in a lot of this work, uh, in part uh, by having the, the free reign to start an agency uh, from scratch. And uh, this uh, creates a lot of space for innovation. And I won't uh, say much more, but uh, please join me in welcoming Secretary Becker. I have to admit um, my own stupidity this morning. Um, we're running a little late because of me. I went storming down to the education building <laughs> and storming in to say, oh, I think this is the wrong building. <laughs> so let's hope my day improves um, uh, from that and that you all have an exciting couple hours here. Well, I'm very excited to celebrate this moment as we launch the state's open source policy and playbook long in coming, very important. Uh, it is the latest in a string of innovations in which the state can take, I think, great pride. Um, and it marks another major example of the good things that can happen when we create the space for innovation. The policy and the playbook are just parts of what we hope to accomplish by starting the Code California Initiative, which is aimed at creating an open source community to benefit California government and the people we serve, the most important. This December morning is a good opportunity to share some examples of what we've accomplished, innovations from innovators like all of you. I've had the honor to serve the state and Governor Jerry Brown as the Secretary of GovOps, Government Operations Agency, since it became uh, in existence uh, over five years ago. And man, has it zipped by, huh? Sheesh. Um, <laughs> as agency secretary, I felt the most important objective I could have in my new role was to help create an energy around the value of new, practical ways of modernizing government processes. We needed to make sure that the processes that determine the work that our colleagues do, day in and day out, truly added value to the lives of the people we serve. And probably just as importantly, added value to the work that our colleagues do for the state. When those processes don't add value, we need to change them. Is that my phone? Oh, goodness. I'm, I'm having a morning, you guys. <laughs> this works best when we have the people who do the work are involved in improving the processes that determine how they do the work. Nothing makes more sense than that, right? You all know what works best because you work in the processes and you know the delivery of those services can be made better or changed. That requires space for innovation and a culture of openness to allow people to collaborate. Our goal is that Code California be a space for innovation and collaboration and then it will help foster truly a culture of openness we have been able to use this energy to build space for innovation many times in the last few years. We don't tend, tend often to be vocal about it. I don't like that much, but we have had some accomplishments. I think it's important to call out a few of them uh, to show that the value of a, what the value is of establishing and expanding a space for innovation. These examples thrive in an open culture, especially when coupled to a commitment to iterate to a, or an iterative approach to continuous improvement. A little bit of word salad. We all, we're all throwing around iterate now. 
just like we were throwing around Agile three or four years ago. It's just continual improvement. You get it as good as it needs to be, and you move on, and you go back, and you keep correcting and keep, keep improving as you learn more to uh, better deliver services. Um, so the example, one, one example, the first example that I'd like to share with you this morning is four years ago, California piloted a lean program that has evolved into California Lean Academy. It's been uplifting to give our colleagues the tools and, a dry, and have put them in the driver's seat to re-engineer processes of their daily jobs. They know best what adds value and what is wasted effort. We have successfully trained more than 7,000 of your colleagues that now have the tools to improve the way we serve Californians. In 2014, GovOps launched the California Civil Service Improvement Initiative. I always like to do this. How many have heard of CSI? Oh goody, I wish it were more. We needed to rethink and enhance the way our state recruits, develops, and retains a model workforce for the 21st century. We've successfully consolidated 4,100 job classifications into fewer than 2,800 classifications. I'm gonna pause, what does that mean? What happened over time in state government that I think just pulled, puts a monkey wrench into it all is every department was allowed, for good and sufficient reasons, by SP, State Personnel Board and CalHR, formerly DPA, to um, have their own department-specific classifications. Now what happens with that? What happens with that is every department then has to run their own exams for between 30 and 50 grand. They have to create their own list, and it's only their list, it's not a shared list. And so what does, at the end of the day, what does that do, those specific classifications where we had 4,100 of them when CSI started, we're down to about 2,800 now, which is way too many also. That means that it takes us about a year to get a recruited candidate in the seat. And that doesn't make California the employer of choice. That doesn't make us competitive. So we went about changing that and I'm hoping it continues. Although our goal is to consolidate all the bureaucratic classes, I added bureaucratic, we also made room to introduce skills to start modernizing our roles, introducing the research data analyst classification series. So I must say it was a little bit confusing to the state personnel board when we came forward with a request to add a new class. They said, Maribel, you guys have all have been about consolidating classes. However, we didn't have the classification in our world that we needed. So we now have a data analyst classification series. And I think the test was, the exam was just posted, correct? So I encourage you all to go on CalHR and check that out and encourage people you know to take that exam. It's going to open up um, some experience and skill sets that we just have not grown in state government. There are more opportunities, frankly, to continue to work on CSI so we do become California's employer of choice. Also, GovOps and the Department of Technology, Amy Tong, uh, launched an open data pilot in 2014 and refined our model during the last four years with an emphasis on civic engagement and on giving departments a place to test out open data without cost of risk, cost or risk. We're in the middle of the second gold rush, and I really mean that. I think of the data that we have in state government as, as a gold, as, the, as rich as the gold that Sutter found. So I like to consider it the second coming of the 49ers. Um, this time, the gold is the data that the state holds and too often just hoards. Very important that we open it up and share it. We have a wealth of untapped data just waiting to be mined and shared to gain insights into how our programs work, to make smarter decisions, and to drive better engagement with the public. Also, CA.gov is, is California's online portal, which of course you all in this room know. We redesigned it a few years ago, keeping in mind that users and services they need have to be our North Star. Having a central place where Californians can find their government services is key. The, 
The redesign of CA.gov was a start, and we will upgrade it and make it better. We will iterate. The next step is to implement our new web standards policy. This will ensure the model that we have for our state should be serving its constituents throughout all of our state websites. We are entering into an era of building digital services. Yahoo! Right? Okay. Lastly, three years ago, our, we partnered with California Health and Human Services Agency, the Department of Social Services, Code for America, 18F, Department of Technology, Department of General Services, and others to embark on the demonstration project that used human-centered design, agile development, modular procurement, and open source to revamp the child welfare service system. Um, this effort gave us an opportunity to collaborate across governments and with industry leaders. We continue to learn from this engagement, and it hasn't been easy. I will tell you we've had some bumps along the way, but it truly was our um, first demonstration project to get us into the new, new form of procurement as well as project oversight, and that's using the Agile process. After all, what was it? What was so important about what we, we undertook at CWSNS? It was the children. These the child welfare um, workers that take care of those children, and the children themselves. Thousands were at stake. And if you have a child that's misplaced in the wrong home, um, it can be absolutely a disaster. And that the program that our social workers were having to use at the county level um, was. Uh, was not adequate for, for them to do their jobs properly. Today, we are building on the lessons that we learned um, from the CWS project and from our partners in the federal government. Under the Obama administration, the federal government led their open source efforts by releasing an open source policy and code.gov, a repository for open source code. They took the first steps, and we thank them for that, because we can follow. Um, now we are adapting their work for the Golden State, and we uh, have adopted a new California open source policy and strategy of our own, following uh, on the footsteps of the Obama administration and all that they accomplished. These commitments show that we are starting to build a culture of openness, and that learning from others and sharing what we learn can help us find a new way, and actually can help us lower the risk of, of the projects we do take on. Open is truly, truly, truly the future. For example, IBM doesn't see its $34 billion bid for Red Hat as a bet. It's an investment. And for IBM, a chance to reinvent itself, it isn't just IBM. Microsoft is working more in the open, freeing up some of its code to share because it sees the value of the collaboration and the value of making developers work easier. As part of that goal, this year, they bought GitHub, the open source repository that is more than just a place to share code. It is a developer community based on culture of openness. Code California shares the value of collaboration through California's own GitHub open source platform, code.ca.gov. Starting this initiative is a commitment, and it puts the responsibility on us to learn how to use these tools as well as the opportunities the marketplace is giving us. Code California is an opportunity to embrace openness, cross-collaboration, and, and share and grow new ideas. Beyond code, this is about building tomorrow's government today with an open culture and with a community that will grow that culture. I ask you to join this effort with the same energy that you have an open, and that you have an open mind. Together, we're going to create an open culture, and we're going to serve the people of California far better for it, and our fellow colleagues. So thank you very much. I know this is going to be an exciting few hours, and I appreciate a few minutes of yakking at you. So thank you. very much uh, for opening us up today, but also for your leadership over the past five years and giving a lot of the people in this room a very long leash to uh, find.
find their, find their passion and uh, find some new tools. We'd like to go on now to our first conversation, and it's going to be with uh, the panel will be uh, people that have been working with us uh, on this um, journey, uh, actually from the very beginning. Um, back in 2010, uh, the California Department of Technology uh, issued a letter that said it would be okay to use open source. That was our policy. Uh, since then, a lot has changed. Uh, Maribel mentioned the GreenGov challenge. Uh, when when we, were, we were launching this um, open data portal at the same time that we were launching this challenge, and I think in retrospect we might have separated by a few more minutes. Um, but one of the things we said is that all the all the the entrance for this, all this the, um, submission should be an open source code. And we kind of, in our little office, thought that sounded cool, but didn't really know what it meant. Um, and we've learned an awful lot since then. And it, that was, it was essential for making those tools usable. I mean, we had that much sense because we were listening to our, our, um, our, our colleagues on the outside. So that, so that what could be submitted could be shared and built upon. And that's exactly what happened. We got. Uh, two very good prototypes that um, the, the Department of uh, General Services used to build upon, and they're they're now um, in, in in part of their workflow. Uh, the other ha thing that happened is we realized that we really needed to get up to speed very quickly on open source code, and we needed to have a place to do this. And so the Department of Technology uh, quickly developed the Innovation Lab and uh, Code.ca.gov which is a place where uh, you could go that was safe to, to um, experiment and see what was happening. Literally, as that was happening, um, we got it launched into the adventure for uh, the, the child welfare uh, project, which is built, we realized like, right then that the only way these modules are gonna work is if they're in open source code and that the, the different teams can work on them and iterate them over together, and it wouldn't have worked any other way. And uh, very grateful for Dave Z for um, for his early leadership and explaining it simply and unthreateningly, uh, so that people could could buy into that. That has been a, um, as the secretary mentioned, a really fascinating and difficult uh, project, but it has it has really shown uh, where this is going. So. We're not doing this in isolation. This has been done uh, in government. We, we tend to lose sight of that, uh, that a lot of these tools and open platforms have been um, very well uh, developed and tested. Uh, it's, we just, Red Hat is, is here for our second panel. Um, they were, were very active in the, in the financial system and airports and all kinds of things. Uh, and it was, it was something we had to learn anew many times. That these these are products that are that are out there. Um, it was exciting when Microsoft uh, made its move for GitHub. It was very exciting too when IBM um, made its bid for uh, for Red Hat. Uh, so this is something that is happening. Um, it is, is going to be a part of our lives, and I think it's going to be very exciting. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. On this, it is uh, we're, we have the good fortune to have Amy Tong, the director of our Department of Technology. We have Dave Zinich, just like just like Dave Z, who is a former uh, 18F executive director and assistant commissioner of the General Services Administration. Uh, I use Mark. I don't want to lose you. Mark, okay. It's, it's, Mark Jones, prior to his current work as the in-house uh, counsel and a compliance and engineer with uh, Civic Actions, uh, Mark uh, was the associate director and IT architect for the state of Connecticut for more than 15 years, so he brings a, a deep well of state experience. Um, so thank you all, and let's, let's, Start with you. Um, if you don't mind, 
given that you are now um, in the, the, the lead on uh, how we're going to do this. Can you talk about California Zoo? Zoo? Okay. 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 Exactly. <laughs> Amy, good morning. Yes, I'm close um, to my mic too. <laughs> Check your mic, guys. Fair end, right. Could you tell us a little bit about what's behind California's new open source policy and, and what you see as some of the possibilities? Yes, yes, yeah, my pleasure. Good morning, first of all, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting us to, to this uh, wonderful conversation about open source. Um, very excited to be here, and uh, Maribel, you made it to the right room, obviously. <laughs> Um, so, quickly, just a very brief, um, I'm hoping everybody in this room, or at least most of you, have seen the open source policy, um, or, um, you know, that's been recently released. Yes? Yes? Okay, good. All right. Um, that is a, an effort that, uh, through uh, a great partnership with all of the state entity within the state of California, and um, worked through our governance process. Um, and, and solicited a lot of input from each department, um, you know, CIOs and agency IOs to say what is it that we need to do to continue a focus of what started years ago as more of a public domain sharing of um, uh, uh, resources. Um, I know there's several CDT executives here, wave your guys' hand. I know that um, you guys have been solicitating. I know Chris is sitting in the audience well and Scott um, somewhere over there. And it's been hearing from our, um, our customer committee, community, that's what we call the departments that we serve, that you know, uh, public domain is something that we already know. It's things that you develop for the state of California that you ought to share within the state of California. There's nothing unique to one department that you know, is you know, specifically for them. So that by taking that a step further, when it comes to code that we develop, let's put some type of standard, let's put some type of preference on top of that, that if you're going to develop code, let's choose open source code as a preference. So it's not only easier to share, but then there's a larger community of the open source community, which I know, you know, Dave and Mark is getting to, that can actually help with upkeep of those open source codes. So that's really the intent of an open source policy. It's furthering this sharing and open community within the government, and then also putting the preference as a standard on top of that. You've been very close to the, uh, the child welfare uh, project um, and the, the evolution of how people think about uh, open source has, has changed because of that experience here in the state. Mm -hmm. um, can, you, can you give us some ideas of how we can get better in deciding where open source is best applied and how to blend it with other approaches? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to ask uh, Dave to jump right. in at any time because I feel like we are the few individuals that were used to work in the GovOp agency conference room where we turn into where we eat and sleep and other activities I won't mention um, in that room to really kind of pivot the whole project strategy into, that was three years ago. That was three years ago, almost, three, almost to the day. Almost to the day, that's uh, right. And, and really, um, yes, lots of lessons learned and we continue to, you know, learning using, you know, through that project. Um, I would say at the beginning of the project, we're all going, you know, being very, very enthusiastic about the possibility of use open source. And, you know, at the beginning, there's kind of pendulum swing to, well, everything open source, you know, free and open source to the degree that we, we got to build it because the only way we can get free and open source is we build everything from scratch. And, you know, after learning that, some of the things we really do not need to build. You know, I, I always, it's one of my favorite examples is, uh, you know, Dropbox. You know, the, the Dropbox that you use to, you know, for move documents and <laughs> all. Yeah. I mean, like, hey, that's something we can use. Why are we building a Dropbox? Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, you know, focus our energy where there are things that we, you know, for sure cannot acquire. And acquiring this mean doesn't mean, you know, you know, thousands of dollars acquire, meaning really utilize. Um, and then so that we can focus on energy where digital services, it's a must to be built. Things that we cannot configure, the things that are so unique to our customer that it's better off that we build. So I think that was kind of like the pendulum swing from everything, you know, building from scratch to let's find the right mix, the best of breed, um, where we can utilize, where we can truly build. And for the ones that we are going to build, let's be smart about it when it comes to open source. 
and, and to be fair, there's been, I'm sorry, Dave, uh, but there have been, um, I mean, as time marches on, there's been new products that have hit the market that have, you know, we have to like change the way we think. And, and that is the, I feel like I'm dominating the conversation no, here, no, so feel free no. to jump in. Um, I, that, that is exactly what I think um, uh, Secretary also has alluded to in an opening, the word being iterative is, is very, very true. You know, three years ago, we know what we know, you know, what was available to us at the time. So yes, decision was made, but you know, credits to the vendor community, I know many of you guys are sitting over here, that also continue to you know, evolve your offering. You know, knowing this is what the trend, this is what the desired of the uh, customer community, and therefore, three years later, there were, there are uh, quite a bit more open platform we can utilize instead of, you know, a few years ago, we had to figure out how to do it ourselves. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for having me. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here in Sacramento. Um, I'm, I'm Dave, um, for those of you who I don't know, which is such many of you. Um, I, I had the opportunity to be here three years ago when I was with H&M. Um, at, uh, at the time, uh, H&M was a relatively uh, young organization. Uh, we had been around for just over a year uh, when we um, and uh, we, I think, like you, had some of our own growing pains and challenges and things that, uh, that have uh, worked and things that we've really adapted. Um, but one of the things that I'm really, uh, you know, frankly, personally proud of is the, the partnership that we have with the state of California and some of the other, uh, some of the other work that we did to really promote new, uh, new practices within government. Um, so just to give you a little bit of my own story, um, I, before HNAP, I was the general counsel for the legislature in D.C. Um, and uh, saw every sort of bad experience that you can ex expect uh, being in government uh, and just hated my tools, uh, hated the fact that the workflows were, were poor. Um, and, you know, frankly, uh, the culture that, uh, that we were in was not, it was, it was pretty hostile to open, openness. Um, and like, like the state of California in 2010, around that time, we just said, well, maybe you can use open source. Maybe you can start to share your data. Um, but there was a relatively uh, new movement in 2009, and then beyond that, we started to start saying we should treat our information like an asset. So it is the gold, the gold rush. Um, there was the open data policy that came out of the federal government. Um, there was a whole civic tech movement that was burgeoning, the Sunlight Foundation, Code for America, and others. Uh, the CFPB uh, was doing some really innovative things. So we all sort of harmonized, uh, came together at h and to uh, say, let's, let's try to reimagine what it could look like to have, uh, have our our government services reflect uh, the best parts of our you know, uh, public service. Um, and so when we came out with California, we, you know, we were taking some of these ideas and principles, and you know, in some respects, this pendulum swings are funny, right? So it used to be, you can't use any open source, don't do anything in the open, keep everything closed. Pendulum swings the other direction, do everything in the open, do everything, do everything ourselves. Uh, and now I think we're finally settling in sort of the right part of the pendulum, which is they prefer, prefer commercial. Um, and this is where one of the things that I think is, is challenging is that um, open source is commercial software. Let that sink in. Commercial, so commercial software includes open source. Um, and the reason why that's true is because if you look at the definitions of commercial software, um, it means that these are things that are available for the public to use and that they can and ultimately consume. Um, and so if you start from the proposition that open source is commercial, that actually is the right framing to start thinking about the what used to be the build versus buy distinction, it's not the build versus buy distinction, it's build, buy, or borrow. Um, or, you know, in thinking about how you can actually reuse the things that are already available and have broad reuse and have broad support, um, whether that's for commercial interest or, you know, other sort of public interests, the idea is to not try to do it all yourself, but to, to use the larger community that exists um, for to great end. And so I think the, the trend that we're seeing with Red Hat, you know, being purchased by IBM, uh, the uh, acquisition of GitHub uh, is just part of a, you know, a long-term movement. I mean, ultimately, we see Google, uh, for example, with Android and, and Kubernetes, among other things. Uh, Microsoft had been before the uh, before the acquisition of, uh, of GitHub, had I think became the largest contributor to open source uh, in, uh, in the world, which is a pretty stark contrast from where it was just about a decade ago. Um, and so, I think what we're seeing is that open source has become um, widely understood as just not just good just because it's good, um, but it is good for business and ultimately good 
good for government. Uh, if we're paying for it uh, and it's custom, then it should be open. Um, and if something already exists that's widely used and is the best tool for the job, we should use it. You know, um, in one of our earlier uh, conversations, Dave, uh, you, you seem to have um, a bit of scar tissue uh, yeah. about some of your experiences at 18F, which is a, a federal. You could A, explain uh, a little bit more about what 18F is and then talk about kind of your experience in inheriting uh, somebody else's policy. Yeah, so we had a, um, 18F, uh, there were two sort of issues, uh, two sort of policies that I, I was confronted with. Uh, first, at 18F, we had a really great open source policy, but it was pretty, you know, pretty expansive. Um, and then during my tenure uh, at uh, the federal government, we had uh, the adoption of the federal source code policy, which again, the secretary mentioned. Um, and both of them were imperfect in their own ways. Uh, in some respects, the 18F policy went you know, far, uh, far to you know, open everything. Um, and you know, build your own stuff, or at least pushing people in the direction of building their own stuff. Um, and then on the other direction, the federal source code policy had some really strange rules. Um, and so the one that I was like most uh, aggressively opposed to um, is the 20% rule. Um, so rather than adopting an open source by default policy, which you know, was a good, good approach, um, the federal government said, well, 20% of your source code needs to be open. You go, well, what's 20%? Is it lines of code? Is it the amount of dollars? Is it, you know, the amount of use? And everyone goes, well, you figure that out, federal government. You, you're smart enough to get this. And so it wasn't really, uh, it was, I understand why uh, they did it, but when we had sort of the conversation, I was pretty uh, pretty bruised from the fact that a couple of years into the pilot, it was like, this is not doing what we hoped it would do. Um, and fortunately, there was a way through the mess, which is to just really wrestle with the procurement regulations that exist. Um, for those of you who are big, uh, big government procurement nerds, uh, it's really getting into the rules about unlimited data rights, uh, restricted data rights around software, and sort of wrestling with you know the provisions of the FAR and the clauses of the FAR that might apply. And if we had done that, I think we would have come to a better place. And so hopefully, you know, the federal government will now do what California is doing, which is to sort of wrestle with that, get underneath it, and adopt a good policy that makes sense for the state. Um, based on that experience, what are some of the, the best practices that you recommend to us as we're we're starting this journey? So I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't treat it as a binary. And that's, that's the first thing that I would uh, sort of recommend is that this is not something that you wake up the next morning and you're, you're doing open source. Uh, you, it takes time. Um, I mean, even, even ETF, which started with, a, you know, with sort of the expectation of doing open, uh, open source by default, um, it took us a lot of time to figure out what good practices exist for, uh, for using open source software, um, how, to, how to develop in the open, um, when to open repos, when not to open repos, when to have, you know, when we have thousands of repos, we go, hmm, this doesn't seem like a good, uh, a good approach. Um, so really try to think, uh, be thoughtful about an evolution uh, of your of your practice. Um, not be afraid of it. Um, you know, one of the things that this is the great myth. Um, people assume that everyone's reading your code. Nobody's reading your code. Um, like, there's a there's a great sense of uh, fear that sort of exists when you say, all right, I'm going to go work in the open. Once you've done it, it actually becomes really uh, becomes really healthy. Um, you know, I uh, the the community that exists in, in the open source uh, in open source software um, uh, is there to make the software better. That's that's why it's there. Um, and so by uh, by thinking about the um, the implementation of the source code policy as not an overnight change, um, but as an opportunity to really improve your practice and to really become a better and more open organization, I think that's uh, the best practice here is to just have the mindset of saying we're going to we're going to try it, we're going to improve upon it, and we're going to set our goal of being an open uh, open organization. Okay. Um, Mark and Dave are both attorneys who have had um, not terrible experiences in procurement, but certainly educational experiences in procurement, and I think it's really shaped their views of, of how to go out and, and buy things and how to think about this. And Amy certainly has some experience in that, that area as well. But let's, Mark, can we ask you a little bit what opportunities do you see in procuring and licensing uh, government open source software and, and uh, can you give us some experience, examples from, from your work? Uh, sure, I mean, I think the, the, the thing that really that game changing about open source is um, a lot of people think it's the licensing and the legal ease around that and 
I spent you know my entire legal career advising people on complying with open source licenses. That's why people usually engage me to ask questions about how do we comply with this license. But um, it overlooks like really the, the power of this is the way people work. So it's changing relationships with people, um, and that's and part of the procurement process too is a lot about relationships, right? So. I spent 15, 16 years, or most of my job was managing vendors, right? We spent we spent a lot of money acquiring software to get the business of our agency done. Um, and it wasn't just like, okay, well, we give you we give you $100,000, you install the software, and then you know you'll send us a check, or we'll send you a check every year from now on, right? Like, there's more to it than that, right? Like, it's how you work with those people. Um, and people, you know, play by the rules that you set up, right? So if you have a, a system that's set up in place where it's like it's a winner or take all, like it's about getting as much money out of the agency as possible, that's what they're going to do. They're going to try and get as much money out of you. If you set up a system where it's about partnership and that's how they get rewarded, that's what they're going to do, right? So changing to an open source model where you have open source licenses and starting to develop your community practices that Dave started alluding to, that really changes your relationship with vendors, right? Like you want to hire vendors who are going to be a partner for your agency where they're a partner in your success because it's not just sign the contract and then see you next year. Um, you're going to talk to them in two months when there's a problem because there's always a problem, right? No one makes software that's perfect. No one makes policies and procedures that are perfect. Like that's always going to change. So how do you create that relationship and what kind of leverage does the state have? I mean, I think the single biggest advantage of having vendors particularly delivering open source code is that it was really easy to fire your vendors, right? I mean, I, I spent years uh, dealing with HR and uh, security systems where, you know, it would be June because our fiscal year ran from June to July, uh, uh, July to June, and be like, man, do we have to give these people another fifty thousand dollars for next year? Like, they're so terrible at their customer service. We can't get them on the phone. We still have these problems. They said they'd fix it, and the conversation was always the same. Or you're like, well, okay, we'll renew the conversation this year, right? Because we don't have time. But come August, after a renewal is all over, we're going to start to look at finding a replacement solution so that by this time next year, we've already identified who the person's going to be, and we've got a transition plan in place, right? Because you can't fire your vendor without completely redoing all of your organizational processes, right? You have to have a massive lift to do that. Where if you've got a vendor who's providing you with source code that you have the right to use forever and including making changes on it, getting rid of your vendor just means like, okay, we're going to keep the technology, but we're going to change who we ask for support. Um, and when your vendor realizes that, all of a sudden they realize what you're really paying them for is support. Like it's partner success. It's not for the source code they made 20 years ago. Um, it's for the support you're giving them today. Uh, and that's really what you need to look for in, in partners, right? Like you want to succeed. You know, like pay them to help you now. Don't pay them for work that they've already gotten paid for 20 times over. I, I have had some bad procurement experiences, uh, and you know, they, that, that actually, in some respects, informed a lot of a lot of. Work that we did, um, you know, we we had uh, we had situations where um, we couldn't. You know, we, I'm trying to be uh, oblique about this, uh, but we because uh, I'm an attorney. Um, but the uh, we, we had situations where we we paid a lot of money for things, uh, did not get what we wanted, um, and then when we actually said, "All right, I want to see what you did," they're like, "Nope, you can't do that. That's proprietary." And, access you go well, what are we doing here folks like this is not a good way of uh, working um, and so open source um, you know does give you that transparency as a government it does give you a license I mean that's one nice thing is that you know if the public can use it guess what the government can use it too um, and so if you have an open source license that basically gets you 99% of the way there with, with data rights um, that you would you know, that you would otherwise need to negotiate with uh, with, with vendors, um, but it also does, I think, uh, you know, in the part in partnership and collaboration, it is a little bit of a clutch, uh, which is to say that vendors understand they're now uh, they're now under scrutiny in a different way, um, and the value is uh, whether they can deliver, not whether they can hold you hostage, um, you know, when when the contract renewal comes around. You want me to follow the two attorney? Yeah, I do, but also I, I, I want to make sure that um, that we reflect that there's that we have built these new relationships, and and, and it's been uh, I'll let you talk more about that, and it's been yeah, I, exactly. Thank you for that. that. Um, like I said, I, I you know obviously I'm not an attorney, and I wouldn't go into the you know terms of condition and all those negotiation that you guys have to go through, but I can speak from personal experience in working 
with the vendor community who does carry, to Mark's point, that mindset, that willingness to partner with you, the, the, the state in this case, as opposed to what my goal is, my bottom line. And we have, you know, uh, spent a lot of energy, and I'm hoping the vendor community see it that the purpose of building that relationship, that collaboration, that partnership, the outcome is that we, together, private and, 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 and public, are trying to deliver a positive outcome to serve the people of California. Not necessarily who gets the, you know, the best deal out of this relationship. And I think that, you know, in some way, um, I would say partly, mainly, yes, a lot of uh, a tribute to this open culture. Also, I think it's the fact that people ultimately wanted to have their product or their service to be recognized in doing good things, not how much money they were trying to make out of you or they made out of you. So I think that kind of coincide of, you know, the, the, the having an open source policy and earlier alluded to an open data, it's really building about this open and collaborative community. So to me, it's more of a culture change as opposed to... It's a significant culture yeah. change. Right, I mean, I don't and know I, right. Wanna, uh, I think it's it's not just vendors either, right? It's right. cultural change internally right. too. Yeah, so, right. yeah. you know, in, in my experience as a state employer, I managed most of these systems around security and identity and access management. Um, those aren't systems that people take lightly, and they tend to be pretty close guards around it. Like, no one wants to get a copy of, you know, a database dump of all the password hashes for, you know, 100,000 state employees and just completely share that, right? Um, but the challenge around that is you get really paranoid about sharing information so that if you're trying to integrate two systems, whether you're federating it um, or you're just trying to bring a new client on board to use a centralized authentication system, if you don't have the ability to have like some common base knowledge around it, people just start saying like, well, it doesn't work. Um, I don't know why it doesn't work. It must be on your side. Um, and you don't need to share the secrets, like the actual secrets, the things that were really secret, like people's passwords. Um, that, that doesn't need to be shared. But if you can you talk the same, now, have the same knowledge base of like, okay, you're using that product, I'm using this product. Like, how do these actually work together, right? How do you have that one configured where you're using that setting? Like, oh, well, actually, you have this bug in that particular software product. And not you, like, the software just has it. Like, well, my software works this way. So if you're experiencing that bug, guess what problem we actually have, right? Our two systems aren't going to be able to talk until we adjust it. And sometimes you can get through and build those relationships really, really easy as long as you know what the other side is dealing with, right? So even inside of agencies or across state agencies, when you're trying to build those relationships, being transparent and open about what you're dealing with helps the other person understand so you can collaboratively come up with a solution together instead of just pointing figures or being frustrated that you don't know how to solve these problems. Because often the knowledge is there, we just have to be willing to share it. And if I could just piggyback on that, I mean, one of the things that it's, it's open source, and it's really a credit to the state where you're starting to, to think about this, is that not only is it an opportunity for the governments to work better with vendors, but it does allow vendors to work better with each other. Um, and that's one of the things that I observe is real up close and personal. Um, you know, I, after I left ATNF, I spent, uh, I spent a year working on some of the mainline systems in the federal procurement space, and we had vendors who, as Mark sort of alluded to, were pointing fingers at each other, but worse, they couldn't plan. They couldn't plan on what other people were doing. They were building the same thing, and then ultimately they were fighting about whose thing was going to actually get implemented. But by working in the open and creating those opportunities for cross-team collaboration and sort of open uh, uh, open communication, it actually avoids downstream you know, sort of squabbles. It avoids sort of downstream uh, challenges, but actually creates a sense of community around the product that you're delivering. Because ultimately, you know, we can talk about money, we can talk about licensing, talk about all this other stuff, but we're all people and we care about the work that we're doing and want to have impact. It's for the children, it's for the, uh, the social workers, it's for uh, the public employees that you work with day to day, it's for the people who visit your state, um, it's for uh, the public impact. And by creating creating a sense of community, not just across vendor, uh, across vendors or government to vendor, but actually a sense of this is stuff that matters for the state of California and we're proud of the work that share that work, that we're going to talk about that work in an open way, it creates uh, a sense of pride um, that, you know, maybe it's a procurement system, but it's a procurement system that you can point to. Um, and it's something that, that you can say, this is work that I did, um, and this is work that's going to help uh, improve the, you know, the lives of my fellow residents. Could I yeah, get piled on right. on that? And I know a lot of audience here are um, 
stay employee, right? If you have, if you work for the public sector, can you raise your hand? Just saying, oh, okay, so it's majority. Yeah, yeah. And by and design. by design, that's right. And and one thing I wanted to build on this, you know, continue to the sharing and open culture is, I think both Mark and and Dave alluded to that while it's good, healthy. Um, uh, not healthy competition, but collaboration between the vendor, if it's something needs to be pointed out. This is also a culture that we, amongst the, the employees of the state, we want to say that if you start sharing your code, you do not have to be afraid of some colleague of yours from another department to say, hey, how come this is written so crappy? You know, I couldn't even make heads or tails out of it. It's not about that, right? Having people looking at, having people work with you, knowing that the end goal here is we're all trying to do things to have a good product out of it. Having more eyes on it and having the mindset of having this being shared, not to be afraid of somebody pointing out what's wrong, but it's more of helping you to how to improve. And I think that is a culture that we want to build in, in the state of California. And as you know, Secretary mentioned and Mark mentioned, when do you see a perfect system coming out of the gate? When do you see a perfect you know, an offering coming out of the gate. If we are, you know, more open and more confident and more comfortable with the culture of we did the best we can, we're going to go with what we have, you know, to meet the immediate need and continue to iterate for it. And that iteration is open to more help that with the same intention. It's not about public shaming, right? right? But what's wrong? Hey, I was going to, if you really want to go public shame somebody, tell them that Amy does not know how to cook. All my staff knows that. And I say, use that as a public shaming, but don't ever public shame about somebody's work being you know, subpar. Because the more you do that, the more people will become reserved. They're not going to share. They can become more closed off. Because you know, nobody should be put up with that kind of, um, that kind of scrutiny. So really, from, a, from a, a state employee and how we work with each other, the open culture in this here is to figure out a way we be very positive, be very confident of the work that you do, and open to that help from your people. That, that brings up a question uh, that about that I've heard from the uh, IT community. Like, how do we how do we make this maintainable? That feels like a lift for a lot of folks. I mean, Mark, if you could. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's a lot of concern around that when it comes to open source software. But I mean, to me, it's a lot of times if you look at if you pick up any any well-regarded book on producing open source software, um, I recommend one by Carl Vogel. It's called Producing Open Source Software. Um, you know, it's a 300-page book. Um, there's 10 pages on licensing. Right? The rest of it is on best practices. How do you well work work well with other engineers, right? So a lot of it's not different, right? It's things that most engineers already know are best practices. Um, they're probably already doing it, right? Like code reviews. Um, most engineers understand if you're writing software, you need to be doing code reviews, right? It doesn't doesn't really matter. Like, and this isn't any different for the non-engineers in the room, right? If you're going to write a policy or a statute or a publication that's going to be released to the public, um, you don't write it and then immediately hit send on it, right? Like, you ask a colleague to look it over, right? It's proofreading. Um, it's collaborating together. Like, that's just the best practice. It doesn't actually matter if you're writing proprietary code, open source code, code you're going to share or not. You want to find the bugs. You want to find the grammar errors in it. Um, same thing with, like, running static analysis. Like, it's kind of sad as an IT industry that the top 10 security problems on OWASP's top 10 are basically the same as they were 20 years ago. Um, we know how to identify buffer overflow problems. Um, like, we need to be checking on those. Um, those are the same best practices you need to do with your open source code. Yeah, there's a little bit of licensing that you have to do as well, but, I mean, that actually doesn't matter too, right? If you're using proprietary code, you're counting seats. Um, if you've got a vendor who's delivering code to you that you can't use in other contexts because it's not underneath government purpose rights, you're keeping track of it as well. So, I mean, the thing you really need to focus on is continuing to adopt IT best practices because those are generally free software best practices. And when you're working in the open, you have the opportunity to collaborate with other people so they can bring strengths in there, right? If you don't know how to write unit tests or you don't know how to set up continuous integration, um, you might be able to look at someone else, how they're doing it. And a lot of the best tools for this stuff now are open source, so they very, are very often fit nicely together in the same ecosystem. The, the other thing that I know is that maintainability, um, sort of picking up on, on Mark's thread, maintainability really doesn't matter from whether it's open or not. Right. Um, it's good, good practices, but 
when there's actually a community that organizes around a particular module or a library, then it actually becomes a lot more maintainable. Um, you know, my, my favorite example of this um, uh, is uh, when you start to look at things, things that are basically now considered universal. Um, so I, I love this open source library. Um, does anybody know the name Dean Richard Hip? No. Uh, so Dean Richard Hip was the guy who created SQLite. SQLite. SQLite was built for the Navy. Okay, it was a Navy project, and it wasn't the, actually the main part of the Navy project. And said, so ah, this feels nice. I have a SQL lightweight database. I'm going to publish this, and he decided to put, publish it to a uh, public domain. And now it's the most widely used database in the world. Um, and it's not because D. Richard Hip was like an excellent maintainer. Um, it's because it was an open source software. Uh, it was publicly uh, licensed in a way that allowed other people to contribute and to make meaningful, uh, meaningful contributions using best practices, using code review, using sort of that maintainability, but having something that's legitimately useful for one part of the world, the Navy, uh, and then having it be useful for the rest of the world, maintainable. Um, and it's thinking about less around trying to make the goal maintainability at the outset, um, but just recognizing that that's a, a benefit that comes from well-designed and well-implemented open source systems. And that's, I mean, a good example, too, of how you think about what you're open sourcing, right? I mean, you look at the world of open source projects out there, there's not a lot of like open source HR projects, right? Um, that were built from scratch. Like they're built out of components. So as an engineer, like we know, like you gotta refactor that code into individual subcomponents. Like you wanna build loosely coupled systems. So maybe the thing that comes most valuable for state employees to share might not be like the child welfare system, right? Like you probably only need to run one of those. It'd be weird if you had multiple child welfare departments. Um, but in the course of producing that, like there's a, probably an opportunity to produce a lot of libraries that don't already exist out there, right? You don't need to recreate things that exist already. That's part of the advantage of this. You get access to a huge existing commons, but maybe you're contributing new libraries to that commons that other state agencies need. You're like, oh well, you know, we didn't realize it, but you know, we actually need a library to parse that file format that's mandated by some federal agency as well. Now we've saved money around that. It's just that library that's really the value out of it. And you don't know what those opportunities are. And so you just share everything, right? So it's not about building source code for other people to use. Just build the source code you need. Build it in a way that's going to be maintainable for you. And these opportunities are going to show up, right? Dean Richard Hips didn't realize he was going to write one of the most, most popular uh, database platforms in the world. And he found out when people started using it, right? And that's what's going to happen here, too, with state code. Is you're going to find out that that little library you have is super useful for four other agencies in the state or 40 other agencies in the state or no other agency in the state but, like, you know, all the municipalities um, because they start using it. And you won't know that until it's made out there and accessible. Good. Um, on that, I think I'd like to ask uh, our audience for some questions. Join in on this. Thank you very much. All of you. Uh, Hi, my name is uh, Ben Flores. I'm fortunate to work for the California Department of Technology under the, the leadership of Director Tom. And uh, I wanted to say that uh, that I have been involved in some FOSS uh, training seminars that have been sponsored under GovOps. Thank you very much, Secretary Batcher, under the leadership of An Angie. And one thing I wanted to share is that something I've seen that I can see in the future is that um, one, of, one of the things that I have to do is look at all non-competitive bids. We get in a lot of non-competitive bid justifications and all the departments come back and say, oh, we have to use this, uh, we have to use this particular uh, company because we've used them for five years and the only ones that can use it with respect like that. And I have seen the future with respect to we can start reducing the amount of non-competitive bids because if we build software in an open source environment, then there's no reason why we have to use the same company. And I know, Mark, I have talked with you a couple times about this and maybe you can elaborate a little bit about how you see maybe how that need for non-competitive bids may go down, which I think would help in the fair and open source, uh, excuse me, the fair and open competition activity that we have in the procurement area. Uh, sure. I mean, that was so writing sole source justifications. We call them sole source justifications in the state of Connecticut. 
um, that was uh, a tortured process often because the real goal was like we just don't want the disruption to the agency. We don't actually care if we can run a competitive bid. Um, so you, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to justify that. Um, and and it, because we know like the reality is like we just can't afford to switch vendors right now because we can't afford to switch our product and our procedures around it, which really kind of undercuts the process for competition around it. Where if you're using a product where you can switch from multiple vendors, and it's not to say like just because you're using open source software, there's going to be a thousand vendors supporting you, right? There's a lot of companies out there that there's only one that does it. But in my experience, you know, using some um, blogging platforms, like we use Drupal a lot in the state of Connecticut, um, we had a choice. And when the first vendor we hired, like, yeah, they set up the system, it was great, we were able to outsource it and get it going, but they really just weren't performing. Like, they weren't being responsive to our end users' needs, they did a good job on the infrastructure, but when it came to support in the long run, it wasn't their skill set, and we didn't have to give up the entire platform. Um, we can just say, okay, well, we actually, you know what, like, we can do a competitive bid around this. We actually have the opportunity to it, and it doesn't require us to throw the whole platform out the window. Um, it, it made it, I, I felt like I was doing a better job with the state's money, right, because the state's money serves so many different purposes, um, but we need to make sure that we're getting the best prices. Um, and when you can have multiple people come and look at the code and say, oh, you're doing that? Well, actually, I can do that, too. Um, and I can do it for less money than other, that other person was doing it because I don't need to charge to redo the entire thing, or I don't need to take, I don't need to guess at what you were trying to accomplish. I can see what you were actually trying to accomplish. I can tell you how I would do it better. Um, you can get more meaningful bids. So maybe you find out like, oh crap, the reason why we're, this isn't working is we're just paying this person too little. Um, you know, they came in with a fifty thousand dollar bid. Four other people came in and said, oh well, you should solve the problem this way. And they were all at 150, 175, 180. And you're like, okay, well, maybe we'll go with the 150 guy because he's actually got the solution that most people would apply to this problem. And the guy who's only charging us 50K, he just can't fix the problem, even though he's the lowest price. So um, it really kind of does change your relationship with your vendors and you know who, who and who you can trust as well, right? Because there can be more transparency around it. You can use the vendor pools who are competing on it to give you a better idea of what's reasonable and what's fair for those prices. Short on time, I think. Signal. So let's take these two, but let's keep. Um, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Dave Sanabria. I'm the lead technical platform architect at Shell Welfare Digital Services. Uh, I've worked for the first year of the project as our DevOps service manager. Now I'm working with my partner here in the security space. Um, one of the things that I've observed is, is that open source is fantastic. I, I use it, I'm a big champion of it. But by itself, it's largely undisciplined. And so, yes, you need the community, but the piece that I'm not seeing, and I'm hoping you guys are also talking about, is the package management. If we build an open source repository for code, super. But what people really like is the node package manager, the Red Hat package manager, the package package managers. Pick. The point is, is that what, what we need is, is to think about not just source code configuration. We need to think about asset and package management so that we can get component level reuse. We're building some Docker containers that we're starting to harden and, and make ready for government use. Those are the kinds of things that I would love to see be picked up and reused. Once we've packaged up Apache web server, and we've hardened it, and we've set it up the way we want, and it's ready to go into a cloud environment, you guys don't want to do that anymore. So I'm hoping that that's also on the agenda, and I'd love to hear you speak to that. Yeah, uh, artifact repositories, which is like more kind of a, a broad term around that. I think that was a challenge that we're starting to see now. You don't have a lot of competition in that space, but with projects like Maven, um, for managing all of your dependencies, like how do you coordinate all this code, right? Because when you're building software, you're building out of multiple libraries, and you have to keep track of all of it. It doesn't matter what the license is on it, right? If you're using a bunch of Microsoft libraries, you need to know when Microsoft patched that library. And if you're not checking to see if there's a new version of it, you've got the security flaw there, right? And it's the same thing with open source code too. So how you manage that and building that into the process is really important. And there are good best practices around how you do that right now, right? So things like not bringing in copies of the libraries, but always like pulling them in as you need them. And also keeping track of what versions you're using are super important. And Docker is a great way to do like full integrated systems around that as well. Amy? You, you go ahead, Dave. I think. I, yeah. I've, the only thing that I'll say about that is, you know, the 
I've experienced the situation where just like you described, we have sort of these hardened, you know, hardened uh, uh, images, um, but they weren't open source, and so people didn't even know that they were available. And so by using open source to publish not just the source code, but the configuration and the package management, I think will actually help other people do the same thing over and over and over again. And I was just going to add on, and I think this does dovetail a little bit to the earlier question about you know, whether this help with the reducing the number of non-competitive bid or so source. I, I do want to set an expectation, you know, just because we have open source policy, we're starting to build this open source community, it's not an overnight effort. In fact, there's a lot of work, there's going to be a lot more work that we probably haven't even gotten to, to really start seeing the benefits of the investment that needs to be put up, up front. To the example that you cited, right? You know, making sure that our, our code at ca.gov doesn't become what I call a dumping ground of just people develop things and put it up there and then you have to like, it's almost like a scrimmage exercise or kind of like figure out what do I need, how do I find it, you know, organizing it to, a, to, to bundle it to where that is useful, to is meaningful. Like if, if not everybody's building child welfare systems, better not, not in California, there needs to be one child welfare system, but maybe some shared services that's common. You know, such as a workflow, you know, moving things. You know, those probably will be common shared service that you use, that you need, no matter what system you build. Those are the things that we really need to organize and target in a way people know where to look. And for you know, like you know, you know, a, a, a Apache server and services that you're mentioning about, those to me, it's more of a next maturity level that we need to get to to make sure that these sharing of resources is as organized as you know the benefit you can glean from it if um yeah if we don't if we don't do that it just becomes a say hey, let's just do whatever we want and, and very soon there's going to be a information overflow it's not going to be helpful very short question very tight answer yeah, <laughs> yeah so uh, uh my name is jacob wagner I, i'm a software developer for uh department of corrections and rehabilitation and obviously, we have some pretty serious security concerns. Uh, and um, uh, we, when we're building software, we do that with security in mind. But obviously, the biggest security flaw is the one we don't know about. Uh, and so uh, I've always been very careful about letting anybody see our code because I'm because they could find a security flaw that we didn't anticipate or didn't know about. Uh, is that something that's that's been part of this conversation of, of how do we, um, you know, are we are we exposing ourselves to uh, vulnerabilities if we publish our code? Uh, I think that's a common common fear when people are, are thinking about going open source. Uh, and the best way, and I've heard Dave say this before too, is um, if you're open from day one, um, usually it's a lot less uncomfortable. Um, if you wait to do security two years down the road, it's really hard to tell. Um, but I would say that if you're two years down the road and you say, I can't publish this software because I'm worried about security flaws, um, you really have to think about your software development process at that point, right? Um, most people who are going to find security flaws in your software don't need access to the software, right? I mean, you don't need access to the source code to figure out SQL injection attack, right? Little puppy drop tables um, is going to be a problem in every school out there because people have access to the web forum and they know how to exploit that, right? And they can do that in an automated fashion. So you look at your web security logs, you know, it's probably underneath attack right now. And if you weren't paying attention to your SQL injection attacks, it doesn't really matter if they've actually source code or not. They're going to find it. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest factor right there. If you open up your code, you have the opportunity for other people to help you with that. Um, and that's really a bigger benefit than it is a risk. I'll just add two things. One, this was one of the hot topics during the federal open source code policy uh, debate. Um, the Department of Defense and the Department of Homeland Security both came in and said that using security for obscurity is not really a good pattern, um, that you should be focusing on having strong security practices throughout, um, choosing things like dependency depth, uh, focusing on you know, good monitoring practices, uh, you know, red teaming, not just relying on closed source software um, is a better practice than just assuming that that's important. So that, that'd be one thing. Um, and then the other, the other thing is um, there is sort of a separation Right? You don't want to put your data, you don't want to put your passwords out there. Um, you, want to per you want to be thoughtful about what you're publishing and what you're not. Um, but, and I'll be very brief, um, at 18F, we discovered that when we started to use open source tools, because we 
leverage what already exists for commercial software. So when we publish, you know, we publish a lot of repos in GitHub. Um, we published in GitHub some keys. Oops, that was a mistake. Uh, fortunately, GitHub scans for you know, for keys, and they gave us a warning real quick. Hey, you published some keys. Did you mean to do that? We said, oops, nope, and we were able to take it down and fix it. Um, if we published to our own, you know, sort of internal Git, uh, Git server, we would have never known. Um, and so by publishing in the open, we actually had a better security posture for them. So. And I'll just quickly wrap. So this continue, going to be continuing to be a hot topic for the state of California on how we actually implement the policy. Um, as I mentioned, it's not going to be overnight. Everybody start publishing and, you know, that check the box. Um, it is going to be, um, um, uh, has to be very thoughtful and be smart about it. And one thing I also wanted to call out that, you know, you all heard of this uh, an analogy of, you know, DevOps, DevOps, right? Development and operation, like those are the only two that you just have to focus on when it comes to agile environment or, or development of such. But we are start using the term, and thanks to our chief uh, information security officer, Peter Lieber, saying uh, Dev uh, security and operation. He actually pronounced that three together. I don't know how you Dev pronounce it. Huh? DevSecOps. DevSecOps. Close enough? Yeah. Um, so, but but that is more of, you know, start embedding, you know, security as a mindset, as a practice on the upfront, not at the end as like some type of a gate you have to pass before you can do things. I think this is, this is what I see the open source um, uh, community. It's about changing behavior. It's actually incentivize good practice. What are you doing closed source code or open source code? Doesn't matter. Good practice of code need to be there no matter what. And security need to be there no matter what. But by knowing, hey, there's going to be more people, not when you see it, possibly utilizing it, it's incentivized good practice to be applied from the very, very get go. And yes, would that come with more time up front? Probably. But is that going to be a good investment to be part of Yes. Is it pay now or you pay later? So I'm, I'm, this is, I think this is a conversation, and I believe this is only the beginning of that, and we would love to have more dialogue with our um, IT community here, and just like tomorrow we're going to have it with our AIOs to figure out what are some thoughtful, methodical, and smart way to really implement open source in the state of California. Well, I hope you'll join me in thanking this panel. Thanks. Thank you.